Okay, should we hit the live video? It's already live. Okay, excellent. Is it 11 o'clock? 58. 58. We're going to wait. We're going to wait. Should start here real shortly, folks. I'll play with the volume here on the uh, sound. I'm not sure how loud it's going to be from what I just heard her just say out loud there. It was not very loud. Good morning, people online. So just so you guys know basically what's going to happen, I'm going to give about a 15-minute comprehensive statement, and then I'll be available for questions. So I just want everybody to be aware of uh, what the protocol today is. We're going to start right at 11. People know I like to start my meetings on time, if at all possible. And we're going to hope to be done around 11.30, because I do have caucus at 11.30. So. Boy, they have horrible reception there in Juneau. So I'm going to let the live people see. We've got quite a few people from the press here. Now, this is my first official press conference that I've called <clears throat> on my own. It's 11 o'clock today, and uh, I'm Alaska State Senator Laura Reinbold. And I'm going to go ahead and take my mask off so I can speak. Everybody is plenty distanced around me. Um, <clears throat> today, I will give my official comprehensive response to Governor Dunleavy's unprecedented letter to me that was unbecoming of a governor and crossed the bounds of civility. The governor's letter is an attempt to intimidate those who question him and his administration and to silence those with opposing views. It is an effort to suppress my First Amendment rights and indirectly the people that I represent. It's unfortunate that the governor has chosen this path for we have worked on many issues together in the past. In simple terms, the situation between the governor and I is a difference of opinion of him handling the COVID-19 disaster response. I've worked tirelessly with many community groups this year to get the state entirely back open, the schools open, and have pushed for a focused response, protecting the most vulnerable while striving to avoid collateral damage to the average person regarding the COVID-19 response. Please allow me to provide an historic perspective. Alaska laws state that disasters cannot last more than 30 days. After attending a National Governors Associated meeting, the governor declared a disaster in Alaska on March 11th with one pending case. He began to issue, issue a litany of mandates with no legislative oversight, raising serious constitutional <coughs> raising serious constitutional concerns because the Constitution clearly states the legislative branch writes the laws. As the fear of the pandemic was rising on March 28, his administration rushed a bill through the legislature, Senate Bill 241, in the dark of the night that unfortunately allowed the disaster to be extended through November 15. The disaster drama continued when the governor illegally extended the disaster declarations November 15th through December 14th over the Thanksgiving holiday when we had all hoped to return to normal. 
without the required legislative approval. To date, we have not seen the data to validate the reason for the extension that the hospitals in the state were at or full capacity. Many people's hopes again was, were dashed. We wanted to be free of the declaration over the Christmas holidays. The governor again, illegally, extended the disaster declaration December 15th through January 15th without the required legislative approval based on the idea that an mRNA vaccine was coming. Then in 2021, the legislator gaveled in in mid-January for the 90-day session. The governor then introduced SB 56 and the corresponding bill is House Bill 76 to extend the disaster through September 2021. Thankfully, the governor agreed not to extend the disaster when the legislature was in session without the proper legislative approval. Momentarily, you will learn why it is important to note that I confirmed with the Department of Law over the past several months that they approved the illegal disaster declarations. The Department of Law also reviewed the 18 executive branch mandates and ensuing health orders for legal and constitutional concerns. Thus, the reason the Judiciary Committee is the appropriate committee to address the disaster declarations and the impacts on the people we serve. A side note, I want to let you all know that I've had this response ready for over a week. I actually had a press conference booked a week ago right now, but because the governor got COVID, I know he has mild symptoms, he's recovering, I delayed my response for a full week, and I do hope for the governor for a full recovery. Back to the letter. Why was the governor's angry, angry response directed at me? The key focus, Senate Bill 56. It's the governor's bill again, where he wanted to extend the disaster declarations through September 2021. Many found that to be intolerable. I worked on numerous amendments in health and social services to disable the bill. In the process, I believe, I won the hearts and minds of many legislators and community groups to warrant concerns with SB 56. SR 2 passed shortly thereafter on the Senate floor with only a 30 day extension and I want to thank all of my legislative senator colleagues that allowed me to pass two amendments unanimously on the Senate floor one for requiring informed consent for the mRNA vaccine, and the second to uh, require informed consent that is required by the federal youth authorization uh, for vaccines that are under emergency youth, youth authorization. Subsequently, Senate Bill 56 has virtually died in the Senate. It's still lurking, but the, the bottom line is the disaster declaration ended on, fe on February 15th. A few days later, the scathing letter was issued by the governor towards me. The real issue at hand is a separation of powers concern. The executive branch, in this case, Governor Dunleavy, is trying to disenfranchise the legislative branch, the people's branch. The governor is virtually accusing me as a Senate Judiciary Pair Chair of seditious libel. He does not want to provide us the ability to question or get information from the executive branch regarding the COVID-19 disaster. The litany of accusations against me that the governor alluded to were not only unclear, but they were unsupported. The minutes of my Judiciary Committee have been reviewed that he referenced in his letter, and it has been found that his allegations are inaccurate. The references the governor footnoted in his letter were reviewed, and it was found that his claims are not substantiated. For example, the Governor Dunleavy claimed that I said he declared martial law. I never said that. Governor Dunleavy charged me with spreading misinformation. However, he distorted my statements and claims that I stated he required mandatory vaccinations. Again, that is false. His letter referenced a Facebook post on February 1st, where I stated just the opposite. The MRA vaccines are under emergency use authorization and cannot be mandated. Another rub with the governor between me and him is I supported 
a separation of power lawsuit that stated the governor should not be appropriating the COVID-19 money, especially when we are in session. The Constitution is clear. The legislative branch is the appropriating body. To date, the governor, with little or no input from the legislature, has redistributed around $6 billion of COVID money with almost no oversight. Just weeks into the disaster declaration, I started Constitutional Freedom Fighters. I worked with community groups to open Alaska. In May, I almost succeeded in these doors behind me in the Senate to strip the governor of his continued disaster declaration because many people had enough in May. I almost was successful. The Dunlap administration has not reached out to me to try to resolve our differences. Instead, they continue to stoke the tension and his administration has canceled multiple times coming before the Judiciary Committee, causing me to unfairly have to cancel meetings. What's going on in the Judiciary Committee that is causing the governor so much concern? First, let me explain that the Judiciary Committee is under Uniform Rule 20 that I stated in my very first meeting in Judiciary, which states the committee is to oversee the programs and activities of the court system and the Department of Law and all bills referred to the committee. This session, most of our time in the Judiciary Committee has been spent working on court reform. And I'm pleased to report the Judiciary Committee moved a major piece of legislation out of committee that helps reform the way lower court judges are chosen after six hard weeks of work. In addition, I brought diversity of thought to the Judiciary Committee that went against the executive branch case demic fear-mongering COVID-19 message. We had the Department of Administration discuss liability issues. Who's responsible if one of our citizens get injured by the mRNA vaccines that he's pushing? Is it the person that administers it? Is it the company that makes it? Or, the, or who purchased the vaccine? What the Department of Administration said, it's the person who actually administers the vaccine, which caused me pause. But it was important to get to the liability issue. I also invited an OSHA expert to discuss the efficacy or lack thereof of masks. The committee also hosted an author from the Great Barrington Declaration who testified a recommended fo focus to the COVID-19 response so that the most vulnerable are protected. However, most people can go on and live their lives normally, which went against the governor's narrative. In addition, a constitutional historian, David Barton, came before the committee to discuss legislative supremacy, and he compared the, the COVID-19 pandemic with many other pandemics that have happened in this country that had a much greater mortality with much fewer restrictions. The Pacific Legal Foundation came before the Judiciary Committee to encourage lawmakers to tighten laws so that the executive branch could not so easily abuse their power. I am working on several bills. Another legal expert uh, came before the committee and talked about cases that have been successful against the executive branch. Let's moving on to questions that I've asked the administration over the last several months. As chair, I requested that the scientific model that the governor used to declare the disaster be validated. It's a UAA model and it was used Imperial College data and um, we'll get into that at another point. But in emails, I requested the information that the hospitals were at or near capacity be provided. In addition, I asked how much money was associated with the COVID diagnosis, how death certificates were identified as a COVID death. I'm still waiting for public information requests to be fulfilled. We have gotten partial information, but not complete information. Recently, I met with AG appointee Trey Taylor, who has asked to come before the Judiciary Committee for his confirmation. I met with him for an entire hour. In that hour, two weeks ago, he never mentioned a concern with the Judiciary Committee, nor did he mention a letter was going to be distributed. However, approximately one hour after this meeting, the letter was distributed 
far and wide to the media before I even had a chance to read it. I was actually on my way to health and social services in the room right behind you. It may be of interest to note the Department of Law has just under 300 lawyers to, that are available to assist the governor and the executive branch. Although this is official business right now, the legal attorneys at Legislative Legal are choosing to step back because they believe that this is a political issue with the governor and what the governor has done is a political issue. My opinion is that everything we do pretty much is po politics and political issues. So I'm still going to urge them to stand by my side. The governor's letter used a significant amount of time and resources. It is a misuse and abuse of power writing an egregious letter spreading a magnitude of misinformation that in reality is outright deception. As one of my senatorial colleagues stated, the governor launched a nuclear political weapon towards me for simply having a difference of opinion of how he handled the nearly year-long disaster declaration rather than choosing civil discourse. Alaskans know my record of public service is exemplary. I firmly stand on my platform, as you all know, and I stick to my core principles regardless of the political consequences, and you know there have been many down here in Juneau. I have been serving on boards and committees for roughly 20 years, and I've never had an official complaint of how I conducted public meetings, and my integrity and work ethic have never been questioned. The public needs to understand that certain uniform rules are suspended on a regular basis that guide us through the process. We all try to follow the rules, but we're arbitrarily call each other out during the sausage making, messy legislative process. Where feisty de debate and diverse of opinions must be tolerated. And I just got a grand compliment from uh, the Democrat on my committee of how I do provide fairness in the committee. This is my ninth year of respected service in the legislature. Currently, as you all know, I'm the chairwoman of the Judiciary Committee, the vice chairwoman of state affairs, the vice chairwoman of legislative council that oversees the legal affairs between the branches of the government. Led legislative council just won a court case against the governor, the executive branch, regarding the required confirmation of the legislative branch with the governor's appointees. I'm also a member of the legislative budget audit where, where we are auditing part of the COVID-19 money. We were just informed last week that there will be a federal, federal audit of the COVID-19 money in Alaska as well. I'm also a member of the important Health and Social Services Committee that meets, again, right behind you in the Butterfitch Room. This is the room where I proposed a number of amendments regarding the governor's disaster declaration, SB 56. I'm also on four subcommittees of finance. I care deeply about the budget and the future of this state. We need to live within our means. Why do I serve on so many committees? As you know, I have a history of serving on a lot of committees because many in our state are suffering. We have high unemployment record levels and the dependency on public assistance is about 300,000. There's numerous businesses have gone under and there are far too many youth struggling, in particular under the COVID-19 issues. Our education system is in crises. The legislature must intervene to get the state on a better path. No one has ever seen such an inappropriate reaction by a governor in the history of our state that I'm aware of. I'm admonishing the governor to retract the letter immediately, to issue a sincere apology, and to begin to take respectful steps to rebuild the trust in the legislative process and recognize the Judiciary Committee for the benefit of the people we serve. Diverse opinion and feisty debate is of critical importance in the political realm without the fear of significant repercussions. The outlandish behavior of the governor should cause pause for all. If a respected senator cannot be treated appropriately by a governor, what can the average citizen that has a harder time gaining access expect? In summary, in essence, the governor is accusing me of seditious libel as a chair of the Judiciary Committee, I'm not able to ask the executive branch questions because I dare to ask pointed questions about the governor's disaster response. He is striving to withhold all resources and testimony before the powerful Judiciary Committee. 
The governor's actions are completely unwarranted and unconstitutional. The governor has made a pernicious attack upon liberty. The Supreme Court rules, rulings have ruled in favor of the people to petition their government for a redress of grievances. I have been denied due process by this executive branch. The governor made veiled charges and then made a conviction and then stated I was guilty and sentenced me to no access to the, to the executive branch and the Judiciary Committee. Then he called for public condemnation as only a dictator would. I took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States and the state of Alaska Constitution, and I will uphold my oath that I take very seriously. I have not violated any of my tenets of the oath of office. In America, we have a representative republic, duly elected, commissioned by the people to fight and defend the rights of the people we serve. Intelligent minds differ. We can have a difference of opinion and even spicy debates, as have happened since the inception of our nation. There should be no tolerance in a free country for an executive branch that wishes to be above the law, to be intolerant of being questioned. The Declaration of Independence was full of grievances toward King George III and his tyrannical rule. Our nation was founded to undo tyranny. We have three separate branches of governor, government to ensure checks and balances that help keep the peace in our nation. The governor's attempt to not answer to the Judiciary Committee will continue to disenfranchise the people we serve. Governor Dunleavy, I admonish you that both your charges and your unjust punishment be immediately withdrawn. If not, you are setting a dangerous precedent that is unknown in the free world, including Alaska. Senator, as chair of the Judiciary Committee, you have the ability to compel testimony through a subpoena. You could also launch a lawsuit against the governor's office. Do you intend to do either or take a different path? I am slowly working through this. I am hoping that he will have civil discourse and that he will withdraw the letter, issue an apology, so we can have a conversation. But I have, I will not meet with him until he withdraws the letter and issues a formal apology. That is my first step, and that is what I'm hoping for. And then if he does not do that, is there a timeline that you would decide to make steps? I'll get back with you. I'm going to take one step at a time. Do you intend to this hear is Peter from Juno Empire. That's right. Thank you. Um, do you intend to hear the governor's bill that he submitted to the legislature and the Judiciary Committee? Well, I have noticed his bill this week. You probably noticed, and they were a no-show. I've reached out multiple olive branches to the governor, including creating a four-day event down here where I let him choose whatever time when I send an email it says basically invite me to an event. So I created an event and he could choose, did not get a response. Anybody else? I'm, uh, Jeff. Yeah, the Department of Law determines the legality of bills so and they determine the governor's declaration was legal. So are they wrong? And your saying wrong? Um, our legal department over at Legislative Legal disagrees with that opinion. Andrew. Uh, Senator, the, the uh, governor has cited the state's low death rate in, in uh, defend, uh, for COVID-19 in defending his policies. What, what do you think of that? Uh, and so what's your, your exact question? What do you think of the governor saying that the state's low death rate is uh, a reason is uh, shows the benefits of policies he's pursuing. Okay, so basically that's a really big debate uh, in regards to, as you know, that the, the models that he was using, I think we're predicting 10,000 deaths in Alaska and I think 14,000 hospitalizations. I need to go back and validate that because the, it was canceled before my committee. It was urged that that needed to happen with Dr. Hennessy in Health and Social Services. So I have forwarded uh, to uh, Senator David Wilson to have Hennessy so I could actually get the model validated. But the bottom line is the places that are tighter packed people, you're probably going to see a higher death rate. Alaska, I think we have roughly a, a mile per, per person. I mean, in the big picture, we've got a lot of spaces. So a lot of the experts are saying that, that the COVID was the deaths were less or the, uh, the amount of transmission was less because of our wide open spaces. Um, Becky. Becky Gore with the Associated Press. Um, Senator, you had mentioned asking about data on hospitals, data on your capacity, but um, TESS keeps track of that online. So what specifically was not provided that you thought was necessary? 
foods so they do a high level and they also apparently i was told that they have readjusted it somewhere of how they were reporting and how the bottom line is we as alaskans want to know why the disaster was extended over the thanksgiving holidays uh, we just need to see the data that all the hospitals were at or near or even the majority of the hospitals were at or near capacity that caused the disaster declaration to continue we need to be able to ask the tough questions um james uh, james brooks again from the anchorage daily news um and a uh, weekend town hall this uh, mm -hmm. in the night zoo you had it was eagle river the eagle river excuse me thank you i'm part of the anchorage municipality yeah. eagle river but i'm a supporter of eagle exit you had mentioned that uh, your Senate colleagues support you on this. Can you give an example of how, how they support you? Okay, I'm not exactly sure how, how I, I framed it at that time, so I'm going to just state that I had, did not invite people to join me here today, and um, I'm going to let everybody independently make, make their choices. What I did say was exactly what I stated, that a Senator colleague said that the governor chose a nuclear political option rather than civil discourse. Is there any other questions? I'll take one or two more. Becky. Do you, is, is some of this misdirected at the administration? Um, the, the governor last spring had issued uh, an order to allow businesses to open up and local communities could issue mask mandates, they could put restrictions on businesses. I guess I'm wondering how you would respond to that. And also, do you feel that you bear any responsibility in, in some of this uh, putting of heads with the governor? I, first of all, I'll start with your last part of your question. I think healthy tension between branches of government is a good thing. In regards to um, your specific question, uh, do you want to just boil it down to the to one because you kind of had three or four uh, mixed in there? I'm wondering if some of this uh, anger toward the governor, like on some of your Facebook posts, you refer to uh, the governor shutting things down or impacts on schools and students, that kind of thing, businesses. The governor had issued an order last spring allowing businesses to open, but communities could decide if they wanted mask and okay. if they wanted. So I I'm understand. wondering if some of that um, concern or anger is misplaced with the governor or misdirected. Okay, and I actually think the anger is, you know, on his side. I mean, it was a very unbecoming, very angry letter. So, uh, in regards to healthy tension, Becky, I've already stated the answer to that. I think healthy tension is, is a very, very important thing. Um, in regards to uh, his mandate number 16, mandate number 16 was the reopen Alaska safely that was often used as a blueprint across the state. The governor had issued on three of his mandates, I believe, that he had power over tribal, local, etc., and so that to me was was pretty big. He wasn't afraid to use the heavy hand, you know, when it was time to mandate things. Um, however, he, you know, when, when Anchorage has been crying out for help for months upon months, he's been silent. And when I uh, was trying to work with him, he said he worked well with with Berkowitz. And so the bottom line is, I think. He needed to be more available to the people to answer the, the people. I think that would have been very, very, very important um, as, as the lead. And, and as a state senator, I try to focus more on state issues. Uh, in regards to, I did go to the Anchors Assembly. I've been before the school board. I've been working with groups. You know, I really did try to work with a lot of local groups, um, but I really try to keep my focus on governmental affairs, especially in my official capacity. This will be my last question. Peter. Yeah, you said that there was a group of lawyers that uh, agreed with the, the governor's letter. Um, was an assault. Could you expand on the lawyers? Okay, I, I don't know that I stated whatever you're saying. I stated I want you to be really clear with the question. I believe during during your statements, you did not say that there was a group of lawyers that, that supported you. Um, I I I. I I tell me exactly. Tell me exactly where. Uh, what I said is that we've. I, I went over the Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, I know there are lots of lawyers across the nation that are having lawsuits that that support these efforts. And I I mentioned several groups that I've had before the Judiciary Committee. There's just look at the issue in Michigan. Look, you know, across the nation. There's there's several people, and even in California there's been issues. So there's a lot of lawyers, a lot of people. In the big picture we've got the heart has to be towards the people. There's been a lot of collateral damage 
and and there's a lot of children suffering the education is in crises we must never forget the people we serve and ultimately as a people's representative i'm going to answer to the people above all and with that thank you very much Wow. All right. Give me just a second here. All right. Let the cat, the, the microphone catch up with it moving around here. And a very explosive meeting there by uh, Senator Laura Reinbold calling out the legis uh, Governor Dunleavy and what he has had to say in that very scanting letter that he had sent out in regards to the questions that she's been having for those in the committees of the governor's appointed uh, members that are coming up and explaining the budget and like she was talking about with the COVID and all the restrictions and the extension of the emergency orders and all those different things that are going on in Juno at the moment. And she has asked some very pointed questions that bottom line to it is, is what us Alaskans have been asking for since day one. You know, like how are the COVID deaths actually counted? Is it did you die of an underlining condition, but you had COVID, but because of the way things are set up, you're called a COVID death? Or did you actually die because of complications created by COVID that caused you to die? You just didn't have a triple bypass heart attack, and then they tested you and found you positive for COVID, and you're no longer a heart attack, you're now a COVID death. Um, even though that was no, you were showing no symptoms, and in reality, if a doctor was doing this and you had the flu, you would have been a heart attack death, not a COVID death. So, you know, very valid pointed questions out there that a lot of Alaskans out here have been wanting to know and have been asking since day one. Um, how about vaccinations and when you get a shot, and they, they will count COVID deaths if you have COVID, uh, but uh, what about you just got vaccinated and someone dies shortly after getting vaccinated? Or, or why isn't that being tracked better? Is that an actual vaccine death? I mean, if we were to count these the same standards that they are putting behind counting COVID deaths, the vaccine deaths would be a vaccine-caused death, even though it was an underlining condition that caused them to die in the first place, may not even be related to the vaccine whatsoever. It is undetermined. Nobody has given any statistically or sound scientific evidence brought forward yet to say the vaccine has outright killed anybody. Um, there are roughly over a thousand people that have died after receiving the vaccine. So the numbers, it's just not clear exactly what that, what, what is the cause. Uh, again, but, you know, if we're keeping track of the numbers and statistically doing what we're supposed to be doing, I mean, using actual science, in using the same theories and, and, and standards that they're putting behind the virus, they should do it for all things out there. And uh, that, that's kind of the accountability that she's, she's wanting to get behind. Um, another is, is the validity of like how well are masks and do they work or don't they work? The virus is small enough that it goes right through an N95 mask. I mean, this is what they're telling us all that the, the only real mask that really works to prevent the virus. The virus is smaller than the filter that is built into an N95 mask. It goes right through the pores. Under a microscope, you can see that the virus itself is smaller than the pore size of what is built into that mask. Um, so how good are the masks that we are all wearing? You know, the one that you went in and you went to the local holiday and you went and bought one of their $5 packets for 10 bucks sitting there on the counter that say they have triple layer protection. 
Um, but you know, how good are they? How do well do they really work? Are you you reusing those masks today? Then you put it back on again tomorrow, and the day after that, day after that one. These are supposed to be one-time disposable masks. Um, are you, you have a mask that's been custom made for you that's washable? You know, are you washing it every single day? Are you changing out your mask several times a day so that the bacterial content that it's been collecting all day long doesn't continue to be transferred by you touching your mask, moving it around? These are the questions that nobody seems to want to answer out there that Laura Reinbold's been trying to get the answers for. Anyways, watch the video. It's, it's nice to hear a, a senator out there that's got backbone and is going to stand up against the woke mob and the mob mentality that you either listen and follow the agenda and only, only talk about what we say you are allowed to talk about versus uh, here's a, a legislator that is thinking outside of the box, asking the questions that we want to know that Facebook and everybody else will label as fake news. And uh, just, just today I was labeled again for fake news for an article that I had posted about the uh, CARES Act bill that is about ready to go through. Our own Republicans, you name it, mainstream media included, have all quoted that 9% of the money that was coming out of that CARES Act bill is meant for the people and actually deals directly with the virus. The other roughly 90% of the entire bill is just a lot of pork. Um, a lot of stuff that they say is related to the virus, but it doesn't. it's not going to be paid out this year. Um, to pay for what actually has to do with virus caused related issues. These are things that they have planned to go out until 2025, 2028. This is their pre planned paid for package that they can ram through without having no bipartisan support in it whatsoever. And uh, they're, they're ex wanting us Americans to accept the fact that we're going to be another $1.9 trillion in debt. That's $30 trillion our national debt is at. When Trump took office, it was just $19 trillion. So now we're at $30 trillion, and Biden has just taken office. If we want to count the $900, $900 billion stimulus that was passed under Trump in December, just before Biden took office, since Biden keeps wanting to take credit for that, and this new CARES Act bills, when he, they, they are claiming giving us our $2,000, um, Biden seems to want to take a lot of credit for things that Trump accomplished that he didn't and say that it was his own doing and to give us our $2,000. Well, what he promised us was $2,000. He didn't promise us, oh, the 600 you got previously and only 1400 more. No, he outright said, I am going to give each and every person $2,000. And uh, he, he's failed to meet any of his promises. Instead, they just put a pork-laden filled bill there that's building bridges to Canada, rail systems and places that don't need to be being paid for in the first place using CARES Act money, um, money going to foreign governments that has nothing to do with the health of Americans and getting us out of this pandemic that we are supposedly in the middle of. Glad to see Minnesota and Texas are completely opened back up. And I believe Florida is another one that is doing the same thing, completely opening up, took away the mass mandates and said no more masks allowed and uh, are required anyways. It's no longer mandatory. They have lifted it completely. All COVID restrictions under emergency orders are now been wiped clean. Alaska can't say that. Um, our governor hasn't shown enough backbone yet to actually do the next step in what needs to happen here. Again, don't forget, like, share this video. Definitely watch it all the way through if, if you're just tuning in right now and catching my recap on everything that happened there. Explosive. Uh, Senator Laura Rybell definitely telling it like it is down there in Juneau and giving it the, the governor an earful, something that I wish more of our legislators would grow a backbone and start doing out there. I got to go get to work instead of being here. I ran 
back to here just so I could live stream this all for you. But now I need to get back on the road and go back to what makes me my my money. I would prefer to be doing this kind of stuff all day long, but that takes folks like you going to my website, politidict.com, and clicking that support button and making a, a small donation today. Everything goes right back into making sure that I have the gas money to make it to different events like the town hall that Laura Reinbold and uh, Kelly Merrick and Ken McCarthy had all had there in Eagle River this last past uh, weekend. And uh, I was glad I was able to be there to live stream that. Uh, that w We had an unexpected Karen show up, which kind of brings the, the forefront, the mass, and how the lunacy of the thought process behind them really is and how far and extreme people are taking it out there, even here in Alaska. But again, go to my website, politidict.com. Click that support button. Make a donation today. All, all money goes right back into making sure that I can be here, pay for the uh, Internet, cover all the bills, make sure that I can keep continuing to bring the, the latest and greatest dirt that's happening here in Alaska directly to you. Have yourselves a great day, and I'm gone.